Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 9th, and my guest is Carmen Reinhardt, professor of economics at the University of Maryland and the author with Kenneth Rogoff of This Time is Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. Carmen, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I want to start by talking about the book, which is a wonderful and ambitious research project, and then we'll turn to the current crisis. What's the goal of the project, and can you summarize the main takeaways? Well, we really wanted to um, provide an an analysis of crises that looked for recurring patterns in a quantitative way. I mean, there are, a, a big inspiration is Kindleberger's famous classic uh, book on financial crises. Uh, but that is, and, and they ring true to nature each narrative, but they are narrative. What we wanted to do was actually go out and quantify it. What are the cycles that lead up to these big blowouts? Um, do uh, countries start to borrow and live beyond their means? Uh, do their asset markets develop bubbles? Uh, do their um, consumers uh, see their saving rates plummet? All those recurring um, those recurring features were the kinds of things we were after to try and quantify. You look at a wide range of different type of crises. Why don't you give a brief summary of the range of stuff you look at, and then you try to categorize what's in co- what they have in common within each category, right? That's right. Um, crises come in different varieties. We have the kind that we just saw uh, in in the United States, the UK. We have financial, or in the old days before. Uh, when we just had banks called banking crises, we had banking crises. Uh, we have currency crashes, uh, so that collapses uh, in the foreign exchange market are also important crises. Uh, for example, Asia 1997-1998 simultaneously simultaneously had the banking crisis and the currency crash. Um, we have government debt crises. And government debt crises, and this is, I think, an important contribution of our book, a sovereign debt crisis, when a government stopped paying its debts uh, to foreigners, um, there's a really good um, documentation of those episodes, of those credit events in the economic literature uh, because they involve a powerful creditor, usually creditors in New York or before that creditors in London. What is much less documented is domestic uh, debt crisis. What happens when the government default on the local citizens? And there are very, that, that's a very different type of crisis in many ways. So um, we have thus far a count of four. We have Um, banking crises, we have exchange rate crashes, we have sovereign defaults on external debt, sovereign defaults on domestic debt, and we have inflation crises. Now, here and there, we also sprinkle that with currency crashes along the lines of what's been recently uh, quantified in a couple of papers by Barrow and Urzua. Uh, So, all told, we have five big crises, and then uh, on top of that, the stock market. So, a total of six varieties of crises, and they do share common characteristics. Um, Well, let's talk talk about – I want to come to banking crises because eventually we're going to talk about the current situation. But before we get there, I'd be interested in hearing uh, what the repudiation of external debt and domestic debt by a government has in uh, what they have in common, just to see if there's any chance 
unimaginable as it would have been a year ago. But if what you think the odds are that the U.S. government might default on its obligations um, somewhere down the road. So what what describes the nature of external uh, repudiation of external debt? Um, what has been the most commonplace uh, uh, episodes since eighteen since uh, World War II has been these sovereign defaults have been largely in the domain of emerging markets, in which confidence is lost very quickly. Uh, there are some advanced economies that had post-World War II defaults. For example, Greece, which now sits at over 100% debt to GDP, uh, was in a state of default till the mid-60s. Um, and so that was just not that long ago. Um, but the post-World War II sovereign defaults have been largely emerging market defaults. Now, that doesn't say that because that's been the case thus far, it's going to continue to be. But generally, what you see before a default um, on uh, sovereign uh, external debt is really an inability of the government to service that debt, okay? And it is usually because that debt is denominated in somebody else's currency. So when um, um, Korea uh, in 1997 came to the brink of default, uh, it was because the debts were foreign debts in, denominated in U.S. dollars, and the Bank of Korea cannot print dollars. They can print one, uh, which brings us to our case, uh, and that is our debts, like the U.K. debts, are denominated in the domestic currency, in our case, U.S. dollars, and that means that you will probably see um, debts inflated away before you see an outright repudiation or default on those debts. Because we can just print the money to pay it you off. You can print the money. And in, let's, let's, let's be very clear about this, okay? Inflation is a form of partial default. It Correct. Is, it, is, it, is, it is a partial default. Right. Now, that's, a right, that's the right point to make. We won't default uh, uh, de jure, but we might default de facto. Exactly. Exactly. And in, in our study in the book, we have a whole chapter devoted to the issue of, well, who is – who is penalized or who, who gets defaulted on? Is it the external creditors or the domestic creditors or both? And when we look at default on uh, the domestic creditors uh, who are usually the ones holding the domestic currency debt, that doesn't apply to the U.S. because foreigners also hold dollar debt, but we're reserve currency, uh, and that gives us a you know, special... But in the majority of cases... Uh, the majority of cases, it is domestic residents holding the domestic currency debt, uh, and we take into account not only the outright uh, de jure defaults, but also defaults through inflation, in some cases hyperinflation. So talk about the title of the book, uh, which I love, uh, This Time is Different. What did you mean by that? Well, first and foremost, the title is ironic. It is meant to capture the um, we are geniuses mentality that characterizes the boom prior to the crash. Uh, namely, uh, the essence of the this time is different syndrome is, well, look, those crises happen to other people and they happen at other times. They don't happen to us, and then when you point out that certain things are off kilter, like price earnings ratios or in debt to income, the reply is, well, uh, the old rules of valuation don't apply. This time is different. And the story of why this time is different varies from episode to episode, but the common theme <laughs> is that the old rules just don't apply to us. Oh, yeah, we have all these warning lights, but but we're different. We're smarter. We've tamed the business cycle. Uh, in our case, in the United States, you know, we have uh, gone as far as, as the great moderation suggests, um, 
you know, though those cyclical uh, turns, let alone crises, those things happen in emerging markets. They don't happen here. And it is that mentality that allows both policymakers and market participants to overlook what begins to be mounting evidence uh, that red lights are blinking, that all kinds of indicators are showing, um, be it a bubble in the real estate market or a an unsustainable current account deficit or household debt levels that are off the charts or a combination of these things. And uh, let me let me say one more thing about the title. Um, I worked a number of years at the International Monetary Fund, and right after the Mexican peso crisis of 94-95, I traveled in a capital markets International Monetary Fund mission all over Asia, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, Thailand, um, Indonesia, you get the picture, all over. And the, the Asian countries were running huge current account deficits, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, uh, and financing the current account with a lot of short-term capital inflows. Yet the perception was a very complacent one that, well, yeah, I mean, in Mexico, the, the, those indicators pointed to a problem, but, but you know, those crises happen in Latin America. They don't happen in Asia. We have high saving rates and Asian values. And that was really, uh, without any exaggeration, a major uh, tipping point for me in just finally convincing me that that psychological frame of mind, which was present here in the United States as well, that those rules apply to somebody else but not to us, uh, is an endemic problem. And and this is very much in the spirit of Kindleberger. I mean, one word, word you know, euphoria is a different is a different take on the same phenomenon. Yeah, I I find that um, find that psychologically fascinating. And we've we've talked with um, Nassim Taleb a couple times on this program, and he, of course, is a very uh, is a student of this phenomenon and from a different perspective. It'll be interesting to see how Americans who live through this. Uh, how this affects our um, expectations for the future. But I, I had a slightly different take on the title, which I'm not sure you intended, and, and maybe I missed it in the book, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely in there implicitly, which is a reference to your earlier remark about Kindleberger's work and other people's work on crises, that they're all – you can argue that each one is different. Um, the title is really a reference to the before the, the fact, but it also applies to after the fact. That's true. So, that very true. so you, you kind of have an tendency to say, well, let's get the forensic equipment out as economists. Let's look deeply into what's special about this one. And, and uh, the question is whether really we're fooling ourselves by saying, well, this time is different. You know, in particular, this time people say, well, it was a perfect storm of all these causal factors. But maybe it's a lot simpler and, and we get lost in the, the trees. What, what I found useful about your book in thinking about these issues is it's, it's a very forest-based approach, which has shortcomings, of course, because it's big picture high, you know, 30,000 feet above the, the crisis. But in many ways, that's what it takes perhaps to see what's really going on. Well, that's that's a that's a, and I, it's a lovely interpretation. I I really and and I want to give an example that this time is different applies in different points in the cycle. I've been emphasizing the psychology before the crisis, but right now we are in a different sort of. This time is different. For example, we can talk about this more later, but I I, I just want to highlight that. Right now we're doing, as regards restructuring our banks, or more accurately, not restructuring them, uh, things very similar to what Japan did in the 1990s. Yet, you know, it's Einstein's definition of a crisis that, I mean, of a a insanity that you keep doing the same thing over again and expect a different outcome. Um, And so, so, yes, the the this time is different uh, problem is is one that is with us at every step of the way, not just in the 
before the crisis, but it, before the crisis is where it re- reaches often its most ridiculous right. <laughs> uh, dimensions, you know, for lack of a better term. Uh, but yes, it, you're absolutely right that it's 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 the okay. Let's look at all the intricacies and highlight why th- this time it's completely different, and you have to develop new models, and you have to develop new regulation, and you have to develop all kinds of new things to deal with the same old problem. By the way, I, I, that quote gets attributed to Einstein, but I don't think he actually said it. I'll we'll put a link up to the. To resolve that that issue, but uh, the oh, please alert me to who it should because it's a wonderful. It's quote. A, but whoever said it, it's deeply it's deeply uh, insightful. That it's deeply insightful. Yeah. Um, but I want to turn now. Why don't we turn to the current crisis? Because y- you point to a, a set of of general phenomenon that precede these type of crises, particularly banking crises, which I want to focus on because that's the nature. So far, uh, this current crisis is not a sovereign debt crisis yet uh, or an inflation crisis yet. Uh, it is a um, – it's a banking crisis. And as you point out, ironically or tragically or tragicomically, we are proceeding to do exactly uh, – we're providing the same medicine to cure the disease that caused the disease, which is rather extraordinary, right? We're we're giving banks uh, lots of easy credit and making it really easy for people to borrow to continue to borrow money in, in a desperate hope to prop things up, which suggests that we may not have seen the end of uh, the current problem. But l- let's focus on the antecedents to this one because your story is a little bit different uh, than a number of we've interviewed about. 13 or 14 people on the program about the cause of the crisis. And you you and Ken Rogoff have a different approach to the antecedents. And I want to I want to focus on that, in particular, uh, the current account story. So talk about that, the role of the current account and, and what you see as part of the uh, what's what the typical cause of these kind of problems and the role that plays. Well, um, uh- let me say this. I, I have been studying capital flows oh for since the early nineteen nineties with my work with Guillermo Calvo and, and Leo Laderman. Um and capital flows cycles uh and what you for lack of a better term, Vincent, my husband, uh Vincent Reinhardt, whom I've also written with and I call these episodes capital flow bonanzas. Capital flow bonanzas, which are when you're running large current account deficits and finance them by borrowing from the rest of the world, usually and badly. And the interesting part of that is that, you know, right now when witch hunts start to emerge after the crisis, you know, you start looking, well, is it is it all the regulators? Is it the Fed? You know, is Wall it the, Street. you know, is yeah. it Wall Street? But the fact of the matter is that one of the beauties, if I may say so, of the 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 uh, work that went into the book is that it cuts across different exchange rate regimes, different political systems, uh, different budgetary situations, uh, more markets, less markets you know, financial markets, and yet common factors do emerge. And one of them is running large current account deficits. And I think the way I look at it is, you know, if you have uh, a disease that is, you know, both a 16-year-old and an 80-year-old are affected by the disease, uh, it manifests itself in somewhat... So the the two are not identical, but there are common symptoms which help you identify the disease. And I would I would put the current account deficits. The and it's not just that you run a current account deficit in one year, a big deal. No, no, it is sustained large current account deficits, which means that over a period of time you are becoming increasingly indebted to the rest of the world. And that is Can I- can I stop you there, Carmen? I, sure. I'm confused about this, and I and I'm I want you to to make the best case for it. Part of what I'm uh, I'm going to challenge you on comes from my uh, colleague Don Boudreau, who writes on this a lot at Cafe Hayek. Now, as a background, 
one of the great things in the book is is showing how similar emerging market crises are Precisely. to to uh, developed countries, mm-hmm. right? I would say it more uh, bluntly: poor countries compared to rich countries. And there mm-hmm. is a there is a hubris involved that you know, mm-hmm. rich countries tend to think they're different. But I'm I want to challenge your claim that running a current account deficit is uh, running debt. So running – increasing indebtedness to the rest of the world in the following sense. In one form or another, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, because in the following sense, in the United States, we, as, you, as you point out, we ran large, sustain, we, large persistent capital account surpluses uh, and current account deficits going back to the mid-70s uh, until the present. And the fundamental question for me and the reason I don't understand the analysis that, that, you're, that you're putting forward is – those did not necessarily increase U.S. indebtedness to the rest of the world. That is, if foreigners buy American equity, if foreigners buy corporate debt that finances real productivity and factories and, and projects, isn't there an important distinction between that and, say, the U.S. government borrowing money to live beyond its means? Is it really the case that a current account surplus – means that the American economy is increasingly in debt to the rest of the world? Well, the Asians tried to convince me of that prior to 1997. Uh, and and uh, let, me, let me say that the current account statement is both encompasses advanced economies and emerging markets. If you look at uh, Asia prior to its, its crisis, it had huge current account deficits. A lot of that was foreign direct investment. So you wouldn't call it just debt flows, Okay. Correct. Uh, um, and which is, I think, very much in the spirit of what you're saying about uh, current account deficits uh, in the United States. The thing is that ex ante is very difficult to know uh, how productive those investments are. True. And also ex ante is very difficult to know how those flow in, funds that are flowing in are going to have multiplier effects through the financial industry. So one of the things that we see, and this is true in emerging markets and it's true in advanced economies, that there's a high correlation between current account deficits and credit availability. Uh, and so that, you know, the, the actual type of inflow that you're getting does matter in, in, for example, the issue of the abruptness of the reversal, for example, short-term bank fund. Uh, short-term lending, be it to the government or to the private sector, can be brutal in terms of how quickly it turns around. That was true in Mexico, and it was true in in Asia, uh, and and it wasn't true in the U.S. because it wasn't primarily bank lending. Uh, but the the association between large current account deficits uh, and the availability of domestic credit is a very strong one. Actually, in this particular book, uh, we don't document that, but in earlier work that I did with Graciela Kaminsky on the twin crises, uh, the causes of banking and balance of payments problems, we do. And, and so a lot of it is it may flow in as equity capital, um, but money is fungible. Correct. And, 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 you know, I wish I could pinpoint some of the you know, uh, exact channels whereby inflows end up as higher consumer credit. But it's, it's very difficult to, to track that. But uh, the, the association between loose credit and large capital inflows is, is a strong one. It applies to, to uh, wealthy economies as well. Uh, it wasn't just the U.S. running, and, and, and I want to go back to the issue of running current accounts since the 70s later uh, after this, but let me also point out that Ireland, Spain, and the U.K. all had huge capital flow bonanzas. And that goes, goes to the second part of the issue, which is how do you define a bonanza? Well, there are countries that run, so that the definition of a bonanza has to be country-specific that you're running a particularly large current account deficit relative to what you historically have run. Um, so it's not just a current account deficit per se, but it's a current account deficit that's big by your own standards. Did Spain run one? Oh, yes. Because, oh, yes. Because what's interesting about those, you just, <clears throat> I'm sure that wasn't totally coincidental, you named 
Ireland, the UK. What was and it? Spain. Did you say Spain? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, those, of course, were countries that also had very large housing price appreciation. Absolutely. Um, which, um, you know, th- there's so much what, – what is fascinating about crises generally and what's fasc- fascinating about this crisis in particular and what's fascinating about economics is there are many things going on at once. And it's very hard to understand that they are sometimes related, that you can't hold one constant while changing another. So I think there's a tendency for people to look at you know the piece of the elephant that they're uh, focused on, the leg or the, wall, the side or the trunk or the tail, and describe the elephant in those terms when, of course, the elephant's more complex than that. But oftentimes we get focused on one thing. So – Monetary policy is one story that people tell as to what these crises had, these problems in each country had in common. There's housing policy problems. But you're suggesting there's a more underlying problem, which is an enormous in, – an increase in availability of credit Indeed. that flows into uh, asset prices. Indeed. And particularly through the banking sector, often housing prices. Indeed. And, and I think staying on the examples – here you have the U.K. and the U.S. with floating exchange rates, so they have independent monetary policy. But Ireland and Spain did not. Um, they were part of the Eurozone. Um, and the, the inflow provides a availability of credit, which can be funneled, in, as you rightfully pointed out, into productive investments. And what we often see during the cycle, and that's exactly what happens in the early stages of the cycle, but then the and, and Asia, the Asian, the run-up to the Asian crisis is a really good example of that. Uh, but then, as the as the inflow continues, you start getting into more of the periphery projects, if you will. You move down the uh, yes, productivity chain. Exactly, <laughs> um, it's the problem. Um, and I don't want to highlight just just the 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 because I think you're absolutely right. There are many factors, you know. I don't want to downplay the importance of others, but I do want to stress the common ones. And and current account deficits and credit availability uh, and increases in debt indebtedness are really an important. Yeah, well, I want to mm-hmm. I want to stick with that because I there's there's another key factoid that I think is often uh, forgotten in this conversation, and you highlight it in the book very, very clearly, which is the consumer indebtedness. Now, we've talked on the program a lot about the run-up in housing prices in the 98 to 2003 period in advance of the subprime explosion, where for a variety of reasons, housing policy incentives, uh, partially uh, the government guarantee of Fannie and Freddie, uh, there was an in- – a change in credit standards that made it easier for people to buy houses with with borrowed money. But as you point out in the book, and this is a challenge to that story, as you point out in the book, uh, consumer indebtedness uh, was growing and the savings rate was falling for a very long period in advance of that. And it really coincides to a large extent with that with that current account story, right? It really – if I remember the data correctly, it really goes back – into the 80s. Is that, mm-hmm. is that the date? That's absolutely right. So one talk about things, that. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, one of the things we have uh, in the book is an abstract, uh, for lack of a better term, timeline or flow chart of the sequencing of crises or particular events. And one of the things that is a big trigger, and we document this looking at and I'll say more about that, the link between capital mobility and, and, and banking crises. But very often the, the process of the big credit boom, the big asset price boom, um, the big boom in economic activity, the large current account deficits, often become, becomes the, the seed of it starts with financial liberalization um, and, or financial innovation. And that can come in waves. And often what you have during that those episodes is, is innovation getting ahead of regulation and supervision. Um, so 
in the in the early eighties, um, you know, we saw a move towards you know regulation. We had Regulation Q, which capped deposit interest rates till till the eighties um, when that was lifted. So so you know, financial liberalization, financial innovation um, is is been an important. So this financial innovation and financial liberalization facilitate. Uh, credit availability. Uh, in some countries, for example, like Mexico, uh, before the years before the crisis, reserve requirements had been eliminated, been reduced to zero. Well, and yet, you know, there's lots of regulations that are were enforced with a wink. There were, particularly again, of Fannie and Freddie. They had their own regulator that didn't keep much of an eye on them. Then they had we had Basel one and two, which. You know, very scientifically looked at different tiers of assets and figured out what the right reserve requirements were for different assets, which of course turned out to be grossly uh, incorrect and inadequate. So it's hard to know how much of it is sort of lax regulation versus the same kind of hubris um, that you're talking about on the well, part of others. The thing is, the the, th- the thing that is common is if if you look at the dates of financial liberalization. Uh, and and in my earlier work, I've I've spent a lot of time documenting the episodes of financial liberalization, namely periods in which you had interest rate ceilings removed, in which you had outright quantitative directed credit removed. You know, all kinds of a common a common theme is is exactly what you were saying that during that period where it sort of becomes the wild wild west. Uh, regulation and supervision are like you know get very low marks. Um, I remember, and I don't like telling anecdotes in response to a question, but this is a particularly relevant one. That I like anecdotes. <laughs> they help you understand things. It doesn't mean they're the truth, but they help you understand things. Um, you know, uh, I, I I was in this. Long extended capital markets mission in Indonesia. This was 1995, and the regulators there were saying, "Is you know, uh, you can create banks overnight, but you can't create bankers." So it wasn't that the regulators were actually out to lunch or anything in that particular case. In that particular case, they were aware that there were these problems brewing. But they just simply didn't have, I mean, you had gone from little over a dozen banks to, to dozens of banks in a very short period of time. So, so that, that the, that's why I said it creates this wild, wild west uh, scenario in which the regulation and the supervision lags way behind the financial innovation that takes place in these episodes. That's why so many of them wound up in financial crises, including this one. I mean, the latest the latest round um, was the securitization of, of, of mortgages, which made everyone very comfortable. Seemed like a great thing. It seemed like a great <laughs> thing. And, it, and, and, and this is not to say that these innovations are, you know, a, 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 you know a, this, no, 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 you don't go that path. No, it's just saying you take the good with the bad. And, and the, 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 Worrisome part is that the most common feature is though that the innovation happens, but regulation and supervision simply just just for one reason or another uh, lags way behind the curve. And you know, in in the case of the Mexican crisis, it was derivatives. The banks were using derivatives, and the the uh, which were supposed to reduce risk. Which were supposed to reduce risk, and the regulators were completely caught unawares. Um, so, so again, even there, although the nature of the instruments and the the nature of the regulatory failure is idiosyncratic to the to the particular crisis, the common theme is that you know you 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 have regulation and supervision lagging behind. Well, one of the things that you point to in all the crises, and it's and I want to turn to this now because I think it's 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 so crucial is uh, excessive leverage, which um, we've been implicitly talking about now for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't mean to alarm you, but you're you're sounding a little bit like my father, who (laughs) who was born in 1930 in the the beginning, in the middle of the start of the Great Depression. 
And one of the things he said to me after uh, maybe a year ago when we were in the middle of the worst part of this, or what we thought was the worst part, we'll see how it turns out. But he said, well, it's obvious what we've learned from this. Debt is bad. Now, of course, debt can be bad. Uh, without debt, life is a lot harder, obviously, to buy a house, to buy a car, to finance new investment, to build a business. Uh, debt is both the uh, lifeblood, as P.G. Woodhouse uh character uh, Eukridge likes to point out. It's the lifeblood of finance, but it's also can be the poison. So uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, you just said that, you know, innovation and liberalization are, can, are part of the problem. Uh, what do we learn from that? Well, um, the issue of debt is, is, it really is central. So I, I yeah, I agree. It, lo, to make a long story short, I agree with your dad. You know that that I, I would just modify it. Is that it, determining what is excessive debt uh, shouldn't require rocket science? But that's when we start bending the rules. Um, you know that not all debt is bad, but that you reach certain thresholds, and those thresholds can be quite low. Um, and then that becomes a problem. Um, staying on the, before I turn to the, uh, regulation and what we've learned, uh, I want to stay a little longer on the debt issue. We, we have, we had written a paper, which is what motivated us to write a book called Debt Intolerance. And that's also, there are chapters in the book that describe the analysis there which is namely emerging markets um, suffer from what we call debt intolerance, which is you get into trouble at what seem to be even low levels of debt by international standards. Namely, half of the defaults since World War II on sovereign debt occurred at debt-to-GDP ratios that would have met the Maastricht criteria. That would have met what? The Maastricht criteria of 60%. Uh-huh. Debt, debt being having to be lower than 60% of GDP. So they would have passed the, the European master criteria, but yet, you know, even at lower levels, they found themselves defaulting. And that is uh, one of the big red flags that we raised, that tolerable debt thresholds can be extremely low, especially if you don't have a track record. Yeah, well, part of that comes back to, I think, what is the mess we're in now, which is um, economics doesn't have much to say about what creates confidence and uh, or loss of confidence. And I, I assume in those cases, there was essentially a run on those countries, a loss of confidence and unwillingness to finance the ongoing... Uh, well, but it's more than that. It's, it's, uh, I and mean, you're absolutely right. There, in all cases, there's a loss in confidence. And so you're absolutely right. But let me suggest that if you were to look coldly at a country that has a debt of 45% of GDP and say, well, that's you know, by international standards, that's not that bad. But at the same time, I gave you additional information that that country had defaulted on its debt several times at comparable levels. Yeah. You might start, you know, looking with greater scrutiny there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and what we created inside the United States was an, a developing country. The subprime market was nothing less than a developing country in the United States. Yeah. Uh, where you had a lot of new entrants into the credit markets with no credit history, often with no employment history. So it, it's it's like having, you know, the same credit standards that you have to apply to emerging markets apply to households here. And that is, that raises the issue that even at what would seem to be reasonable levels of debt, problems can arise. Oh. And and this is not to at all because I believe also exactly what you say that confidence shifts are critical critical in determining the timing of the crisis. Right. But that there are important uh, you know issues about debt sustainability that during the boom phase often get shoved under the rug, which you know brings me to the the second question or re the, the second part of your your remarks which you know, had to do with, with what what we have learned. Well, you know, I think I'm more concerned with, with what we will forget hmm. than 
I know this sounds very negative, but I can't help it. You know, it's part of my, my personality. It's all right. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic, so <laughs> we'll kind of cancel each other out. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I mean, I really think that we will have memories of this for a while, but then the next generation will not. And um, the um, generation that, or the group of households that have lost their homes um, in this crisis, the, the, the foreclosures and have had, you know, credit shutdowns and job losses and so on, the memory will live much longer there. Yeah. Much longer there. But on the whole, if I can be as bold as to predict something, Go for it. we will forget again. Oh, no doubt. Well, that's what's great about the book. It uh, Certainly the um, the MBAs that are minted in uh, 2020 – and go on to Wall Street will have a harder time remembering this unless they just happen to come from one of those homes, and they're not as likely to, I suspect. Um, let me let me turn to an issue that I didn't notice in the book, and it came up in a recent interview on the sh- on the show with uh, Charles Calamiris. And Calamiris has a history of banking crises in the United States, and he has a different story to tell, or at least it seemed different. So I wanted to get your reaction. His claim was that. If we look at the 1874 to 1913 period, which was a period of increased capital flows, capital mobility, globalization, and compare it, say, to the last 30 or 40 years, which had a similar flavor, there was a much larger number of banking crises in the recent period than in that period. And he defined a crisis probably different from yours and and Rogoff, which is he defined a crisis as large waves of bank failures – with lots of losses. And he said basically in the earlier period, the 1874 to 1913 period, there's a handful of of crises, Argentina in 1890, Australia 1893, where there was serious um, loss of of net worth in the failed banks, 10% of GDP, Norway in 1900, Italy 1893. And he suggested that in all those cases, government had distorted uh, the return to risk-taking by having some sort of implicit uh, subsidy to risk-taking. And in the recent period, we'd seen an enormous increase in that with the advent of too big to fail. What's your reaction to the implicit or explicit government guarantees in in encouraging the leverage that underlies uh, the crisis of today or the, or the ones in the past? Okay, let me take the, the 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 question or the issue in two two parts. One is the first one is factual, and then the very important issue of guarantees, which I think is is really a critical issue. Um, on the first one, um, we document the crises for sixty six countries and the incidence of banking crises in the golden age of capital mobility was was huge. Uh, and the only reason that the numbers are higher um, for the more recent period is that we also have more countries. I shouldn't say that the only reason. A reason, an important sure. reason, is we have more countries uh, simply we, that were colonies back then, uh, number one. And number two... Uh, that some of the countries that didn't even have a banking sector uh, in that earlier round uh, have more developed banking sectors now. So the the incidence of crises the denominator is uh, bigger. It, exactly, exactly, and and so that that's that's you know that's um um so so that's that's as the number in terms of now taking that into account the share of crises which is still somewhat higher. Okay, uh, I would point out that uh, the issues of implicit guarantees that Charlie's making is, an, a, ter- is a terribly important one. It's very linked to 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 uh, our debt story. You know, if you feel that, I mean, if you feel that in good states of nature you're going to get a great return. And in bad states of nature, you will be bailed out. Your willingness to undertake risk and to borrow 
and I stress borrow, uh, is going to be uh, importantly affected by that. And this is corroborated by the fact that if you look at these post-World War II crises, what is private debt before the crisis often winds up being public debt afterwards. Yeah, you you point out that uh, public indebtedness uh, surges dramatically in the aftermath of all of these. And, of course, in our current situation in the United States, part of that is is deficit spending, but, but a large part of it is bailout. A large part of it is bailout, and, and, and not just bailout in the direct sense of the cost of the bailout of a TARP kind of thing, but also assuming debts that oh, were yeah. somebody else's. Yeah, the Bear Stearns assets being guaranteed by the Fed. And- absolutely, absolutely. And, and let me say that our, our measure of rising indebtedness, um, you know, we have a, a figure basically showing that if you look at the three years following the crisis, central government debt increases in real terms after adjusting for inflation by about 86%. Uh, well, that actually, we believe, is a conservative estimate because we're really looking at central government debt. So there are a lot of new guarantees that are not realized, meaning that the government actually hasn't taken them over yet or hasn't had to take them but they or will. not included <laughs> yeah. there. But they will. Like, you know, right now uh, the Fed has about a trillion dollars of Fannie and Freddie's uh, – balance sheet on their balance sheet, and that's not going to turn out very well, in my my guess. So you're right, that hasn't been um, recognized. No, it hasn't been recognized. So, so uh, you know, I want to, first of all, I want to say that, uh, um, you know, that the issue of, of implicit guarantees is very important, is a very important magnifier. But that, you know, the kind of fast innovation, you know, you know, capital mobility internationally, capital mobility uh, within the financial system is associated with, or historically has been associated uh, with uh, a huge incidence of banking crises because the drop-off that you see in the incidence of banking crisis in the period uh, after World War II is a pretty marked one. I mean, we actually plot this out from 1800 through... Uh, 2008. It's quiet in that it's period. It's quiet. It's a quiet period. It's a quiet period with the good and the bad. I mean, it's a very unusual period because it's also after part of the world had been importantly, uh, le- you know, um, leveled after yeah, the war. I think that's uh, a huge part of it. So, no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's unusual on many counts, but one of the things it is unusual in is that it's very quiescent. Uh, in terms of the incidence of, of, of crises but that of comes any back, kind. That comes back to our earlier conversation, mm-hmm. really, because when so much stuff's been destroyed, a lot of what you're rebuilding is real stuff, yeah. presumably that's productive, and yeah. the low-hanging fruit to start with is very productive. Exactly. Exactly. But, yeah. Uh, no, I suspect that that is it's, it's, it's a very important point. So I'm, I'm very um, fascinated by the, by the too-big-to-fail implicit guarantee issue. I don't see how it – so I'm sympathetic to that, but I don't see how it fits in with the rest of your story. So I want to hear Hidden you – Hidden debt. Well, here, here's what I'm thinking about. If, let me um, – I'm going to go 30,000 feet up and, and, uh, and be critical of my story. So I, my story is about uh, implicit guarantees, excessive leverage on the part of financial institutions – um, excessive leverage on the part of homeowners, excessive leverage on the part of government-sponsored enterprises. Everybody's playing the same game. They're gambling with other people's money, which is, which I think is a huge part of the problem. But the counterpoint would be, it seems to me, is what you said earlier, that a lot of that is just, oh, that's the trees. If you go back to the forest, it's that, it's that current account deficit. It's the, um, it's the giant pool of money theory, which um, I'm skeptical of, but it it seems to run through a lot of these, so it makes me wonder. Um, how do you reconcile those two stories? They're, they're, that, well, they're, let me, and let me rephrase it a different way. What's driving that current account deficit? Is it the implicit guarantee, perhaps, no, by no, U.S.? No, 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 no. Well, I, 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 but I, what implicit guarantees does is magnify the effects. Uh, 
by by let, let me let me start out by saying that if you don't have credit availability, the issue of moral hazard is just doesn't. It's it's I wouldn't say moot, but well, you know, you don't have credit availability. Yeah, it doesn't matter so. whether it's guaranteed or not. Right. It, you're not going to be able to borrow. Period. So you need the, the you need the seeds to be sown by credit ample credit availability be it from home, be it from abroad, or be it from both counts. Um, and then the moral hazard story amplifies it because it creates for the government what we call hidden debts. That in effect, um, the government's debts don't take into account the fact that huge chunks of the uh um, economy are borrowing on the expectation that they will be bailed out by the government. Uh, so, so it, it amplifies the demand for credit. Is what it is how it fits in. But you need the credit availability. But I wonder how much mechanism. of it. I mm-hmm. wonder. How, I wonder how much of it is the um, uh, the lack of incentive to invest money carefully, right? Because. And the thing that comes to mind when I'm thinking about foreign capital flows, I'm thinking about China buying uh, Fannie Mae debt, Fannie Mae bonds in the probably hundreds of billions of dollars and um, not worrying too much whether Fannie or Freddie is buying up loans that aren't as safe as they used to be because they're pretty confident and it turned out to be true that the treasury was going to stand behind them as were domestic investors in that debt. So part of it is an increase in debt, but it's an increase in debt in debt and leverage for particularly unproductive assets, which is part of the story. Right. And that part is where the moral hazard really, uh, really amplifies, it seems. Right, right. It is, it is, a, it is a very, uh, for lack of a better term, it's a very lethal amplifying because it makes the boom in credit larger and it displaces the quality uh, of the lending towards the lower end. Just as a, a historical footnote, my understanding is that England ran a current account surplus for close to a century, maybe a little longer. Do you know if that's true? That it lent to the rest of the world. Yeah. No, that no, that capital flowed into England. That England ran a current account deficit and a capital account surplus for about 120 years. Well, well I mean, uh, England lent to the rest of the world. For, for, I mean, if you look at the emerging markets uh, of the day, all that all that money was coming from from England. Uh, England had uh, huge, uh, you know, huge tracts of time in which it was before the U.S. even appeared the only lender. Uh, if you look at the cycles of debt. Uh, in different pockets of the world, not just emerging markets, it was fueled usually more often than not from capital flows from England. Okay, but I thought they ran a current account deficit. That's not true. Yeah, I mean, if you go for for lo- for long stretches, you you get the cycles, which is one of the points that we make. These things go go in cycles, but they had huge cycles uh, in which they were the the biggest the biggest lender. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, you can you can run deficits or you can run surpluses for extended periods of time, which goes back to my earlier uh, comment about capital flow bonanzas, and it may not be unusual for your standards. So uh, you, you, your definition of a, I mean, um, our definition of a capital flow bonanza is that you're getting something high relative to your own standards. Now, England, as the reserve currency, uh, had a uh, you know had had its own uh, had its own cycle in which if you looked at it relative say to Australia or to Brazil you would say wow what a what a deficit uh, but it, but not not by you know it was it wouldn't classify as a capital flow bonanza by British standards interesting um, shifting gears we're almost out of time. Uh, the marketplace is suggesting that there's not going to be a lot of inflation uh, in the near term. 
What does your research show is the pattern of inflation after these crises? After banking crises, uh, there is no clear-cut uh, aggregate pattern for inflation for um, <clears throat> excuse me for the whole period. Let me divide it up into the following. Um, on the whole, banking crises were had more inflationary consequences after World War II than they did before World War II. There's no association between high inflation and and banking crises that we could discern prior to World War II. After World War II, where you see a higher incidence of inflation in the aftermath of banking crises, it's really predominantly accounted for by Latin America. So, so in terms of the banking crises uh, of the advanced economies or other regions, especially outside Latin America in the 80s, there isn't a strong link between, um, and I'm talking now in the in the you know in the uh, five years, you know after three to five years after a banking crisis. Okay, now after five years, there's so many things that are, you know are going sure. on that it's it's really you know you begin to 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 be able to link it to the banking crisis proper. Uh, what what concerns me more, most about inflation is not something that is imminent. You see? Sure. It is something that is in more in a five, ten year horizon where you've been carrying a higher level of debt for a long time. Uh, but, but the concrete answer is what I just gave you, that in that period immediately after the banking crisis, you know, with this Usually we look at a three-year horizon, but in the inflation analysis, we also extended it to five years. There isn't an obvious link outside of the Latin American post-World War II experience. Well, that's pretty optimistic for you. <laughs> well, it's, it speaks to the next. It, it speaks to the next three years because, after all, we've already been two years into the crisis. Correct. Um, so, yeah. but but you know, beyond that. Uh, it's very difficult to say, well, inflation here went up because the debt built up during the crisis, and that was the reason inflation. You know, it becomes more tenuous to, to link it back to the um, to the crisis itself. Yeah, but here in America, we see a case where the Fed has injected enormous reserves into the banking system that have not been put out into the economy, but have the potential to. So it's hard absolutely, to know. absolutely, and I think the inflation question is one, in my view, be, on the basis of what I've just said and also other research, uh, is that, and I think I can speak for Ken here as well, is that uh, the inflation question becomes more pressing in a five to ten year time horizon. And it's not five years from now. It's five years from when the crisis started, which was two years ago. Yeah. Um, because um, uh, if we were uh, an emerging market that had had a long history of defaults, both explicit and through inflation, that horizon would be compressed, which is hmm. what I what yeah. I mentioned about the link between banking crisis and inflation in Latin America and. Well, I think in the eighties, uh, but but for other cases, you know, you, you have more time. But I think I can't remember whether it was in your book or whether I read it recently somewhere else. What was what is uncharacteristic about this is that a lot of the world, in the middle of this uh, contagion, turned to U.S. Treasuries, allowing the government to continue to borrow, which would be very un not be the case in an emerging market situation. That's absolutely right. It's That's very, absolutely right. Yeah, Vincent, my husband, Vincent Reinhardt, and I wrote uh, a short piece for, for Vox EU, a blog, uh, called Too Big to Fail. And it was, you know, asked the question, how often do you see people running into a burning building? <laughs> Which is exactly, you know, <laughs> what we saw in the height of the crisis in 2008. Uh, I think, and, and I'm glad you brought this up, because I think, also, a question that has been sort of, you know, circling about is the issue of are the dollar days numbered as a reserve currency? Um, and 
the reason the two are tied is that during the height of the crisis, the alternative to dollar assets um, were not there. And, you know, that um, you need... You need something, you know, like in economics, we so often say you need a model to, you know, beat a model. Hmm. Uh, here we need another currency to beat this one. Um, right, that's, we, that's that's the tallest pygmy theory, right? <laughs> right. The <laughs> exactly. dollar was the tallest pygmy. The, it was yeah, a pygmy, yeah, but it was the tallest right. pygmy. That's, yeah. absolu- that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. It wasn't. It wasn't because of a, you know, it wasn't irrational, but it was also, you know, lack of alternatives. Yeah. Um, and and that's a point that I've been highlighting that, you know, in our study, we have debt issuance, uh, issue by issue, going back to the very early 1800s. And one of the things you begin to see, you know, as early as the 1890s, uh, you know, after bearings and so on, bearings crisis and so on, is you start seeing emerging markets issue more debt denominated uh, in dollars rather than British pounds. Mm. You also see more emerging markets begin to link their exchange rates to the dollar rather than the UK pound. These were telltale signs that the the pound had begun to have competition, okay? Yeah. It wasn't displaced yet. You know, but it began to have competition by after you know after World War One. Then you know New York was in big time. So by the time that the actual end of the official Sterling Zone in sixty seven, nineteen sixty seven came about, it was you know not really. It was de facto it had already happened, but that's a long period of time that I'm, that I'm, I'm you know in which the dollar emerged. Uh, over the, the that period as the alternative, and one one last thing on this is if you look, uh, people talk about the euro as an alternative. Well, you know, uh, central banks and investors don't buy euros per se; they buy assets. And in the euro market, we still have German bonds, Greek bonds, uh, Spanish bonds, and they're very different. We don't have the the equivalent of the U.S. Treasury market, and in China has a non-convertible currency. So, so what I'm getting at is that one of the things in which the crisis episode with people running into dollar assets at the height of the crisis in 2008, and actually the dollar appreciating against most currencies, which is unusual. Uh, has to do with the dollar still uh, retaining its its role um, as reserve currency. Now we continue to make policy mistakes, right, left, and center, and that would change, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, that is one thing that is slightly different this time, but maybe not for very long. Maybe not for very yeah. long. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it. What what I'm saying is, we need for that alternative to crystallize itself. Yeah, that's a good point. I want to close with a quote from Arnold Kling. He recently wrote in a study for the Mercatus Center at George Mason the following, and I, I want to get your reaction to it because you've talked about your pessimism about the psychology of, of uh, investors and, I would, and probably regulators. Uh, this relates to the latter. He says, the lesson is that financial regulation is not like a math problem where once you solve it, the problem stays solved. Instead, a regulatory regime elicits responses from firms in the private sector. As financial institutions adapt to regulations, they seek to maximize returns within the regulatory constraints. This takes the institutions in the direction of constantly seeking to reduce the regulatory tax by pushing to amend rules and by coming up with practices that are within the letter of the rules but contrary to their spirit. This natural process of seeking to maximize profits places any regulatory regime under continual assault so that over time the regime's ability to prevent crises degrades. I don't know if you agree with that and whether you think there's any optimism for future regulatory structures given our um, tendency to forget the lessons of the past and where you think we might make some progress, if at all. Well, I think I share the sentiment, in which is what I he, – he said it much better than I did that, you know, the regulators and, and the supervisors are – 
usually running behind the innovation, uh, which is why regulation can't be static. It has to be uh, up to speed, which makes it very challenging. And what also makes it very challenging is, uh, and this gets to, I think, your question, the tendency for complacency to set in as time elapses from your last crisis. And so I am not really confident that we are going to, uh, you know, uh, come up with a regulatory framework that uh, prevents a major financial crisis from happening again. I don't think a major financial crisis is uh, in the States now, I'm talking about, not elsewhere. Elsewhere they're brewing already. Uh, but in the States, I think that... Um, it, it will be it will be a while because the memories will there and because there's sort of natural checks um, and more awareness. But as that awareness fades and financial markets morph from their present status into something else, um, which they will, <laughs> which they will. Um, my my bet is that. Um, it will all happen again. My guest today has been Carmen Reinhardt of University of Maryland and author with Ken Rogoff of This Time is Different. Carmen, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.